So this is the second uh, talk in the series after we restarted after COVID. And uh, as you know, this series is intended to be held like three to four times a year, uh, bringing here a prominent scientists that who will give us uh, talks, uh, kind of unusual talks in the sense that they either present a breakthrough result or uh, describe an area or a direction, or sometimes their vision for the future. But it's not technical, these are not technical talks, but kind of special types of talks. And the idea is not only to hear the talks, but also to some extent uh, interact with the speaker. So for this reason, we have uh, on the one hand, uh, more than usual time for uh, questions at the end of the talk, as well as a lunch later on to which on the fourth floor with to which you are all invited to talk between yourselves but also with the speaker uh, and lastly i just have to say that we are starting to plan next year so whoever has the ideas of uh, uh, speakers who you think would be suitable to invite for next year please uh, drop me a line and now I will ask uh, Claire, please, to introduce the speaker, and then we'll give it back. Thank you. Um, hello. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Véronique Cortier. She is a research director at CNRS. Her research area is cybersecurity, cybersecurity, and more specifically, her area of specialty is the verification of protocols and proving uh, protocols. Uh, Véronique Cortier was born at LSV. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the word verifi verification. Um, <clears throat> she uh, is known beyond her research area in particular for the development of something that probably most of you have heard of and have used, namely Vilnius. And she's also known in the broader public for her book about electronic voting, Le Vote Electronique. Um, she has been uh, recognized with a silver medal of CNRS in 2022. And I asked her how she came to study computer science. She said, many years ago, when she was at ENS Cachan, <coughs> as a first year student, she wanted to study math, but she had a computer science course that was mandatory, no choice. So she took that course, no interest, but, and the course was taught by Antoine Petit. And it is because of that course that she became a computer scientist. So we can express our gratitude to Antoine Petit for that contribution to the field. Thank you, Antoine. <laughs> Thank you very much for this uh, very nice uh, introduction. And indeed, I mean, thank you, uh, Antoine, for this uh, very first talk on the. I mean, can you hear me with, if I talk like this? So I think I would. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Parfait. No. No. Perfect. Thank you. So yes, thank you very much for this nice introduction and for the, the invitation. So indeed, my talk will be uh, about uh, electronic voting, uh, one of my uh, uh, main uh, area of research now. And so why people are using electronic voting? So one reason is really because they find it convenient. So it's convenient for voters because they don't need to go to the polling station. They can go, uh, they can vote from home or from abroad. And for authorities also, they don't really, really like uh, watching the ballot box. So they are quite happy uh, to delegate this task uh, to, to, to some company. So they don't need to record and tally the, the vote. And also, uh, I mean, in France, we have quite easy uh, election, but in other countries, sometimes they have a, a lot of uh, questions 
or the wrong candidate, so tallying the votes may be a complex task. Um, it may also be so, I mean, one of the arguments is also that it may uh, give more, more access, more, it may even give more democracy because you can then is more easily um, choose a complex study uh, system like where you rank or uh, grade uh, candidates and then using uh, STV like in Australia or Condorcet like in Debian. Uh, you can use it more often. So for example, uh, in, uh, in Switzerland, they are voting three or four times a year with about five to 20 questions. So for this, anyway, they, they, for, for now a long time, people do not go to the polling station. They vote by uh, postal voting. So it's remote voting anyway. And sometimes also there are very complex rules, like in Australia, where in a state, in a state in Australia, it's bigger. There are, there are five states. So you can divide mentally Australia in five, and you see it's quite big. And they have, uh, they have a rule that lets any voter to vote in any place in their state. And they have local, local questions. Okay, so they have questions that are dedicated to their tone, for example. So if I go in another tone, they have to issue me a ballot with my set of questions that correspond to my tone. And then my ballot needs to be tallied. But of course, it cannot be tallied individually because my vote, uh, my vote would be known. So my ballot travels back to my uh, initial tone. So they have a lot of ballots traveling, which makes uh, voting complex and maybe insecure uh, also. So in the literature, there are plenty of protocols that have been uh, proposed, and I'm going to present one of them. And, uh, and I like to say that for the moment, for any issue we have in electronic voting, we have a solution, but we don't have a solution for all the issues. So we're still not ready for a perfect uh, voting system. Uh, I'd like to make a, a distinction uh, about uh, vocabulary. Uh, when we talk, when people talk about electronic voting, there might be actually two kinds of electronic voting. Uh, one is voting machine, where people actually attend a polling station and use a voting machine. Um, uh, so the good point of it is that it's standard authentication. You, you, I mean, you, you authenticate yourself as usually on, in polling station using ID cards or other means but you're using a machine that you have, on which you have no control and you have to go to a polling station anyway. And there are internet voting where people vote from home or from anywhere using their own computer, which means they have more control, but also maybe these computers are less secure. And in this talk, uh, when I say electronic voting, I actually mean internet voting. So this talk is really about internet voting. Of course, some of the issues also apply to, to voting machines. And I can also take questions about voting machines. So why people are not uh, a bit afraid of electronic voting? Well, they are right to be because there are numerous attacks. So uh, uh, I think now three years ago, uh, there were an election in Moscow and ballots were posted on the blockchain. We still don't know exactly why. I mean, because it was hype, but besides this, we don't know. But a good thing is that, and it's not, I mean, it's never the case in France, there was a bug bounty program. So it was allowed to attack the system before the election. And there were even... Uh, one uh, million uh, rubles for, I don't know the name in English, uh, for this. And actually, so some uh, researcher in our lab, uh, Pierre Godry, uh, showed that um, so the, the, because of the blockchain, they only have blocks of uh, 256 bits. Okay, so it was quite small for a key. I mean, we know these keys are too small. So that's okay. Instead, since I can't use, and so they decided to use a, a key of uh, 768 bits, which is already not so big, but better. But it was too big to fit in the block, right? So they said, okay, instead of one key of this size, they take three smaller keys and encrypt with each individually. So of course, it's like, uh, I wanted to tell this to my kids. It's a bit like you want a lock of uh, one million digits and you don't find it at the supermarket. So instead you say, okay, I'll just buy three of 100 bits. But of course, you have the same number of, uh, I mean, of, of uh, uh, that take three of two digits. Okay, so it's 100. So you have your million, but of course, it's much easier to break because you just break them individually. So, so it was broken in 20 minutes. <laughs> so then in another context, uh, a context where they also have uh, uh, public scrutiny. So it's also allowed to see the code and to attack it. Uh, it's really a context where they make things much, much, much seriously than in the Moscow context. 
Um, and in, so it was possible to look at their code. And we also found, despite all the efforts they made and, uh, and the expertise they have, uh, we also found a privacy breach where it was possible to silently add ballot box and, uh, for each indi for, indi for individual ballots and actually learn uh, the secret, uh, the, the votes of uh, dedicated voters. So if I have time, I will explain this, 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 this uh, attack in more details. But so, I mean, people don't, I mean, it's, it's legitimate not to have com uh, trust in, in, in electronic voting because regularly there are still attacks. So, okay, there are attacks. So what would be a good voting system? So this is the, the uh, let's take it uh, from the other side. So one of the first property we might think of is often confidentiality. No one should know how I voted. So there are some elections where actually you, you don't care, you vote by raising your hand, for example. But in many elections, to let people have the freedom to choose, uh, there's no one should know uh, how I voted. And the issue with electronic voting is that this might not be sufficient. So it's even better if you have what we call receipt freeness of coercion resistance. So no one should know how I voted, even if I'm willing to tell. And why is it important? Is that because if I tell you that I voted A, I may lie in front of you. And this is very important. Because if I cannot lie, if I can prove you how I voted, then I can be uh, threatened or bought to, to vote in that way. So if, if I cannot lie on how I voted, then there might be vote buying or coercion resistance. And I've been told that in Italy, it's uh, 50, uh, 50 euro for a vote. So I don't know if that's true. And also because it's electronic voting, so there are traces, there is cryptography, cryptography that may be broken in several years. So there is not just privacy, vote privacy, but also what we call everlasting privacy. Is it possible that my vote becomes uh, public in 20 years if cryptography is broken or if the keys are lost or whatever? So, I mean, yeah, it might be quite embarrassing if my kids in 20 years know how I voted. Oh, maybe not, but... So this is one property, but there is also an equivalently important property, which is verifiability. This is something we have in paper ballot, or quite well in paper ballot, is the way to be, uh, to, to, to be unsure that the, co the results correspond to the voters. So we, here we, we, we speak about uh, individual verifiability and universal verifiability. Individual verifiability is what voters need to do by themselves. We can't do this by, for them. And so we distinguish between cast as intended the ballot contains their intended vote, because as a voter you click, then there is some ballot that is issued. Does my ballot, my sealed envelope, contains my vote? So this is cast as intended. And then this is, there is recorded as, as, as cast, is my ballot in the ballot box? Okay, I have sent my ballot, did it reach the ballot box? So this is individual verifiability, and usually this cannot be discharged. The voter has to do it itself, itself, which is not easy. And then we have what we call universal verifiability. Voters can do it, but also external auditor. It's tallied as recorded. So you have the ballot box, which is typically the encrypted vote. It should be the case that anyone can check that the results correspond to the ballot box. And then eligibility, only ballot, and the ballots that are in the ballot box only comes from legitimate voters that voted only once if there's a right to vote once. What is nice when you have all these properties is that we have, what you need to verify is the election data and not the entire system. If you have this kind of property, you no longer need to trust the voting server, the code that is running on the voting server, the operating system, and so on. Your, your own, if you have cast as intended, then you don't need to trust your computer. So it's, it reduces the trust base. And also, this is a, re, a property that came more recently in our field because, I mean, as a theoretical uh, computer, uh, I mean, working research, we said, okay, if we have all these properties, we are happy because if we detect that something went wrong, well, we just cancel the election and we rerun it, right? So fine. Well, not so fine, right? Because in reality, it's not so easy to rerun an election. So it's even better if we, if we have what we call accountability, meaning if something wrong is detected, then we should be able to tell who, who to blame. Because in that case, Possibly. So first, it's an incentive for people to behave well because they know they can be blamed. And then it's easier to know who to punish and to reduce the cost and so on. 
And of course, there are also many more properties that are not security related, but are equality, equally important, like availability, the server should be available, and also accessibility. People need to be able to use the system, to be adapted to various uh, uh, issues. So, I mean, it's very important, but it's not my area of research, so I'm not going to talk about these properties. But it's, it's a constraint. I mean, we, we cannot assume people are Turing machine. So. <laughs> so, I should be able to prove, I should not be able to prove I have voted, and yet I should be able to check that my vote has been counted. So it's clearly two conflicting properties. And uh, I'm going to show how this can be realized partially uh, with a protocol that apparently some of you have already used. So maybe you know already how it works. So this is Belenius. It's a variant of Helios. Helios is used in particular by the EACR, the uh, international um, group of uh, cryptographers. So we have enhanced it with, uh, I'll explain how. So it's developed at Loria, so uh, our, our lab. And the main developer is Stéphane Blondu, and it's been used in yeah, more than 2,000 elections. It's roughly more than one or 2,000 elections each year now, so actually the, yeah, the figures are even larger. And Bellinus ensures the confidentiality of the vote. I will tell you under which assumption. And also uh, verifiability in the sense that, uh, so if, yeah, if I go back to my properties before, I mean, we have recorded and cast, tallied as recorded and eligibility. I'll explain how, and we can discuss it. And But we I can, dis spoiler, we don't have cast as intended, not in Bellinus. So we have some form of verifiability. And in particular, the ballot box is public which is very standard in academic uh, electronic voting protocols, but not so standard in, uh, in, in many, at least, uh, French uh, companies. So I don't know who already uh, used uh, electronic voting besides Belenius. Many. Okay, so then we can, uh, we can, we can discuss at the, at the lunch if there was some verifiability, if you could access to something uh, after, uh, after the election. So in Benius, the, the ballot box is public at any time, and all the operations can be checked by anyone, or at least anyone willing to do it, anyone willing to operate the software we propose, or anyone willing to develop its own software. So the building blocks are, of course, uh, cryptography. And so one of the first um, ballot box we use is, I mean, encryption, public key encryption, that I guess you are aware of, with threshold, meaning, each trustee can compute uh, their secret key, and then the end trustee jointly compute a public key, and then uh, t out of t out of n keys are sufficient to decrypt. So it's like at the bank, uh, the, the, there is a lock, and two out of three are sufficient to open uh, the, the, the lock. Or, and then, so, in cryptographically, we can do two out of three, seven out of ten, uh, as we wish. And this can be done in a fully distributed manner, meaning that the decryption key is never present on a single computer. I mean, each trustee has its own uh, shared key. Uh, so in theory, it's very easy to do for a long time. It's very well-known cryptographic uh, building blocks. Of course, in practice, in real election, it's often the case that uh, the decryption key is actually uh, uh, generated on one computer, then split, given to the trustees, and that at decryption, they just take the key put it together, and then they use it. So, but in I mean, the, the, yeah, the cryptography, the research is very mature on this, on this field, so it's easy to do. Then the second important building blocks is zero knowledge proof, so the possibility to prove that you know something without revealing anything more than that you know it or the statement about this. So for example, here for my talk, the kind of zero knowledge proof I'm going to use is uh, I can prove that my encrypted message is either A or B, so I can give uh, the encryption of M with a K key and prove that M is either A or B without revealing anything more than, well, M is either A or B, but uh, you won't know whether it's more likely to be M or, or B. And there's also the possibility to prove that the decryption is correct, so meaning if, I'm, uh, if I have the key, I can uh, produce, uh, if I'm given a cipher text, I can give the plain text and prove to you that yes, M corresponds to the decryption of, of C, with the secret keys that I'm not going to give to you. Okay. So with these two building blocks, we are ready to, 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 to see how Belenius, Belenius works. So as I said, there is a 
public ballot box. So when you arrive in the election, there might be already, I mean, the election has started. So you have uh, Alice, Bob, and Chris who voted already. For simplification here, people are going to only vote either zero or one. Zero if they disagree, one if they agree. You have the public key of the election, PKE. Okay, and when David arrives on his computer, he computes, he chooses his vote, VD. Uh, his, his computer encrypts his vote with the public key of the election. So you have this encrypted ballot. Then David authenticates to the ballot box, send uh, it, his ballot. And then David can see on the ballot box that indeed there is uh, his ballot, encrypted ballot, on the ballot box. Okay, so he can see that his ballot has indeed reached the ballot box. It's not just congrats, you have voted, it's really, you can watch on the public web page that the, your encrypted ballot is there. And then for the tally, Belenius uses the fact that it, that it uh, relies on L-gamal encryption that has some homomorphic property. If you multiply, multiply the ballots, you get the encryption of the plain text. And this is just due to the fact that uh, G to the A times J to the B is equal to G to, G to the A plus B. So any, this is a public operation. Anyone can multiply the ballot. So anyone can get the encryption of the sum of the vote. But still encrypted, right? But what is nice is that you do not need to decrypt individually, because then you would know how Alice voted, how Bob voted. So the only thing you need to decrypt is the final result, encrypted result. So the authorities that uh, have a share of the, of the, of the key, uh, I mean, if you trust them as a threshold, they will never decrypt individually. They will only decrypt this cipher text. So they decrypt it and they prove that they decrypt it correctly. Each, I mean, collaboratively, they decrypt it and prove that the decryption is correct. So as a voter, you can be convinced that the result corresponds to the sum of the votes that you can compute yourself. Okay. Okay. Of course, I have oversimplified a bit the protocol. So here, as it is presented, there are attacks. So for example, if David is malicious, he could not vote one or zero. He could take advantage of the fact that the ballots are never opened individually. So he could vote 100. Okay, okay. not too much if there, are, if there are only 50 voters, it's not a good idea. But if there are 1,000 voters, then it might be a good idea. And then if he does that, of course, he will vote 100 times for one. So he will stuff the ballots, stuff the ballot box. So how it is done is actually, this is not plain encryption as I just said, it's David should encrypt his vote and prove that his vote is correct. So it's either zero or one, okay? So this is how it is done in Belgium. You prove that you voted correctly, either zero or one, or more generally that your vote is, 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 is in the list of valid votes. Okay. One other simplification is that uh, at least in Belenius, the name of the voters do not appear in clear in the ballot box. So in France, this would be uh, actually illegal because uh, how, whether you voted or not is not a public information that can be processed uh, publicly. I mean, as a voter, you might be, have the right to look at the voter list, but it's not a public information. I should not, for example, if I watch the ballot box, I may notice that you, that you voted at uh, one in the, in the, in the, during the night. And this is not a public information. So the list of voters who, who, who voted is not public, which means you just have the list of encrypted ballots. So if the ballot box is dishonest, I mean, remember that Belenius is run by your, our own server in Loria, okay? Do you really trust that? So if the voting server is dishonest, it could add some ballots, okay? At the end of the election, for example, add, add a couple of ballots for one and put a cross uh, for, some voter, for some voters that didn't vote, okay? Just, just add a couple of votes. I mean, we have heard that it existed in some, uh, in some places in Paris, for example. <laughs> so the ballot box could add ballots. So what is done in Belenius is that, and the reason why the ballot box can, can add ballots is that the only entity that authenticates voters is the ballot box. So if the ballot box says, uh, Veronique has authenticated to the ballot box, you have no control about that. The ballot box tells that. Okay? And it's an issue in many systems, actually, when the voting server is the only entity that authenticates uh, voters. So what is done in Belenius is that we have a double authentication. So it's, it's a bit like a threshold, but it's just uh, one over two. So it's a small threshold. So now voters not only need to authenticate to the ballot box, but they also need 
to sign their ballot. So during the setup, there is an extra entity, a registrar, that should be independent from our voting server. So it can be anyone uh, from the anyone from the organization that generate private signing keys for each voter. So now to vote, I need a password for the to the voting server, but also a credential that is actually a signing key. And so David, Alice, and Bob actually sign their ballots with their credentials, and the ballot box only has the verification keys. So now the ballot box cannot add a valid ballot because it cannot sign with a valid credential. Okay. So the ballot box itself cannot stuff the ballot. The registrar alone cannot stuff the ballot box either because he would need to authenticate to the ballot box. So now you need to corrupt both. And of course, you can have several registrars, but it can be a bit annoying for voters to enter a lot of credentials. Okay, so this is roughly how Belenius works. And now that I have first presented a simplified version, show you attacks. I mean, if you are, I mean, since you are a researcher, you should not be confident that it is secure, okay? I mean, maybe I'm just hiding some more attacks, maybe. Or maybe there might be attacks I don't, I don't know. So what we do, and this is really a current practice, is we do a formal analysis of uh, voting system and more generally of security protocols. And so I don't think here I need to convince of the interest of uh, formal analysis, but uh, still <laughs> it's becoming a standard practice in the field because it allows to find attacks before in implementation are, are done and before systems are deployed. So it's now in current practice, especially in TLS, 5G and so on, because once a flawed protocol is deployed, it's very hard to get rid of it. I mean, because you always have some servers that are running some old version of TLS, and for compatibility reason, this is still allow it. So for example, your Firefox is probably updated with the best techniques, but it's still ready to downgrade to some not so good uh, algorithms, just because you still want to access your uh, yeah, some old uh, web page or server. And so, so, so it's very hard to get rid of flawed, flawed protocol. And actually, in electronic voting, and in Switzerland, it's even a legal requirement to provide a symbolic proof and a cryptographic proof. So it's in their law. I mean, for us, it's really like golden world. <laughs> so they say the protocol must meet with the security objectives, blah, blah, blah. In addition, a cryptographic and a symbolic proof must be provided. The proof relating to crypto, blah, blah, blah. And they can, so they even explain in the law What are the trust assumptions you may have, like random oracle model, decisional defi Elman assumption, fiat chemi heuristic? I'm really waiting for the point where in the French law it will be written uh, which, which security assumption you are allowed to use in your proof. Okay, so what does uh, cryptographic and symbolic proof mean? So in security protocols, we have two main models to, to do proof, to, to analyze uh, uh, protocols. One is what I will call formal approach, and it is what they call symbolic. And one is uh, what I will call computational approach and what they call cryptographic. Okay? So in the computational approach, messages are bit string, so it's just any bit string. Uh, the encryption is well the encryption algorithm you are using, LGAMAL, RSA, or something else. And the adversary is any polynomial time uh, probabilistic Turing machine. So this capture what is doable by an attacker in a reasonable, reasonable time, so probabilistic, uh, and with some probability. So the guarantees we get here are quite strong because the adversary is any uh, attacker, but the proof are often done by hand. So now there are actually tools that can do, that can check the proof but with a level of automation that is uh, typically much, more, much lower than for the formal approach. So it's difficult to handle complex protocols. When you have complex protocols, you typically analyze a smaller part of it. And so uh, in contrast, there are the formal approach where messages are much more abstract. Uh, so they are uh, represented by terms, so you can see them as labeled graph. And the adversary is idealized. It can do some operation of these graphs or on these terms, and that's it. Nothing besides this set of operations that you have defined, which means that some guarantees may be, some attacks may be missed. I mean, if, if your cryptography allow to do uh, um, I mean, some algebraic computations, then you won't capture that. But the, in exchange, the proof are often automat automatic, so you have now good tools to process uh, big, uh, big protocols. And to analyze big protocols, meaning either 
having a security proof or finding attacks. So a bit more words on how we represent messages. Uh, so as I said, it's it's term. So which means that for each primitives we have, like on, on ciphertext or signature, we say okay, we'll represent it by uh, an abstract uh, function. So a function symbol that takes some arguments. So for example, for asymmetric encryption, it will be three arguments: one for the public key, one for the randomness, one for the message. For concatenation, we'll say, okay, this is a symbolic uh, function that takes two arguments, uh, the left one and the right one, okay? And then, for example, if I want to represent uh, the asymmetric encryption of a pair of two messages, two votes, V1, V2, I will say this is just a term, so a graph, rooted by the functional symbol uh, asymmetric encryption that have three uh, sons. Uh, one for, uh, it's just a leaf, uh, so one symbol for the key, public key, the randomness, and then a pair of two leaves, V1, V2. So I just keep introducing the structure of the message, and that's it. Okay, I, I forget about the algebraic encryption. Of course, I still give some, uh, some I have to reflect some of the properties of my primitives. So for example, with an equational theory, so I can add equation, uh, with more symbols, saying that uh, if I take the left projection of the pair x, y, then I get x. If I, get the, if, if I apply the right projection of the pair x, y, I get y. And then for asymmetric encryption, I can say that the asymmetric decryption of an, uh, an asymmetric encryption gives the plain text uh, x. And same similarly for, uh, for, for uh, symmetric encryption. And many, many more. So we also have uh, equation for zero knowledge proof. And since in e-voting we have many types of cryptographic primitives, uh, we like to have many, um, a lot of variety of uh, equation series. So uh, yeah, if, if you, I mean, and we, and we still take techniques from the more uh, theoretical in computer science. So yeah, if you can, the more equation series you can handle, the better for us. So please. So this is for messages, and then we need to describe the behavior of the of the protocol. So how, how messages are processed by participants. For this, there are actually many uh, models. So I'm presenting one that is quite popular, uh, which is uh, the syntax of uh, tool Proverif, which is a dialect of the applied pi calculus. So here it's like an abstract programming language, very abstract one. Uh, so we have processes, so we have the if construction, if m1 equal, if m1 equal m2, then p else q, we have the let, and then we have uh, abstractly communication channel, like this process input on c, something that is uh, then stored in the variable x, and then pro pro proceed like, like p, and this, this one output on c, some term, some message n, that is a term, and continue like p. We have the new construct, so here it's a, just a new fresh symbol that has not been used anywhere. And uh, this is used as modeling for a new key, new nonces, new something. We have the parallel composition, so this means P is run in parallel with Q, with an arbitrary interleaving between uh, P and Q. And this uh, uh, bang P is P parallel P parallel P an unbounded number of times. So this allows to, to, co to consider uh, protocols uh, arbitrary number of times. And we have also some decoration, event E, as is more to reason about security properties. So it has, has, it has no modeling semantic for the execution of P, but this will allow to reason on if P reaches this step, this step then blah, blah, blah. Okay? So for example, if I want to model the role of a voter in, uh, in Belenius, so I have David that is going to uh, send uh, his vote uh, encrypted. So the voter is a process that has some parameters, public key of the encryption, the vote, the ID, and some, some authenticated channel to the ballot box. And this can be modeled as I generated some randomness uh, to, 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 to build my encryption. Then I build my ballot, which is my ID, uh, David, and then the asymmetric encryption with the public key E, the randomness I just generated, and the vote in a record that I voted. This is to talk about security. And then I output on the authenticated channel, and I also output on the public channel so that the attacker can see it because there is no, I mean, channel is just either known or unknown, so we have to model the authentication. Then 
in Proverif, if you want to, to tell, to ask Proverif if something is secret, you just a special keyword, uh, the attacker should not know S. So what does it mean intuitively? It means something like, uh, you have your, you have modeled your protocol as a process. And if you ask for the secrecy of S, it should be the case that for any adversary, so any process that can be put in parallel, P parallel A, never reach uh, a state uh, where uh, the S is uh, output in some, on some channel C that is public. Okay. So if you want to verify that S is secret, you have to verify for any process put in parallel with, uh, with P, you, never, you can never output the secret. So there are also what we call correspondence queries. So this is, we use here our event. So, and, and we can write queries like F1, Fn implies F. So for example, voted IDVR implies counted. So I didn't talk about this event, but we can say, okay, if, if my voter voted, then it should be counted. Okay. And then what does it mean? It means for any attacker, for any trace, we look at uh, an execution and we look at all the events that are emitted, emitted. So in any trace, uh, of P parallel A, if F1, Fn appears in the trace, then F should also appear in the trace. Okay, so this is the kind of properties we need to, to verify, to check, if possible, automatically. Another type of property, so these are more trace properties, this is an, an equivalence properties. It's also often the case that we do not want to talk about a trace property, but an equivalence property. The attacker should not distinguish whether he's talking with Alice or Bob, she does not distinguish whether Alice is voted zero or one. Uh, and so this is useful not just in voting, but also for anonymi anonymity, privacy, and so on. So here it's, yeah, I'm not going to define this, but it's really uh, for, uh, I think I, maybe I have some, no. Uh, so it's really for any attacker, anything that can be observed on the right is the same that what can be observed uh, on, the, on the left. Okay. So this is the kind of property we want to verify. And one tool that exists now for uh, 20 years has been developed by Bruno Blanchet and now also with uh, Vincent Cheval. It performs very well in practice. Uh, it has been used on many existing protocols, um, all pro protocol, toy protocols of the literature, but also many industrial protocols like TLS, Signal, and so on. It has been used to pass the Swiss requirement. I mean, remember, they want a symbolic proof. So it has been used for the two main protocols that have been developed in the, in the Swiss context. And how does it work? So actually, internally, Proverif translates this applied pi calculus into uh, first order logic. So I'm going to explain uh, how, how Proverif works. So uh, first order logic and hard closes so a, a fragment of the, of the first order logic uh, actually is very, a very good fit for the attacker um, computation to reflect what an attacker can do. So here I use a predicate i to model what an attacker can know. Okay, so i of x, the attacker knows x. And the kind of things I want to write is that for any x, for any y, if the attacker knows x, if he knows y, if he knows x, if he knows y, then he knows the encryption of x, y. He knows also the concatenation of x, y. And then he can decrypt if he has the key. So if he, if he knows the encryption of X and Y, if he knows the key Y, then he can decrypt. And this is symmetric encryption. If he knows the projection, if he knows, sorry, if he knows the pair X, Y, then he knows X, because it's just a pair, he can just project. And if he also in, he knows Y, okay? And what is nice here is if I have more properties, I can just add more formulas, first order formulas. I can also do this, uh, and from a protocol, uh, Proverb does this also for own clauses, for protocols, sorry. So it takes these protocols written in this abstract programming language and transform it in, in, a, horn, in a logical uh, formula. So for example, the first, uh, the first, so what is emitted here is that the attacker, takes, so it should be slightly different model, but the attacker could take The, the voter could take his vote from the, for the, for the, from the network. So the attacker, if he knows a vote, then he can get um, uh, David to, a, to emit uh, his ballot, which would be the identity, which would be this term that depends on the vote. And you see here something weird. I mean, here it's a new R bit string, so it should be a fresh uh, symbol. And here it's R of V. I mean, And the, the issue is that in uh, first order logic, I have a, a, a finite number, uh, I mean, typically, 
a finite number of uh, constant or names. So I cannot just introduce a fresh one. I don't have this in my, and this is not first order logic. So I make this randomness depend of what I can. And what I can is just V. Okay, so this is a limitation of the translation uh, that is uh, inherent to, to Proverif and to many models. And I can have a similar uh, first order logic for the voted event. If uh, the attacker decides that David votes V, then I have the voted event with ID V and R of V. Okay. And here you have seen one limitation, and I'll come back to, to this uh, later. Yes? Sorry, I'm, I'm just trying to parse the logical sentence. Uh, there are some variables that are not defined. What, what is ID here? Right? Is, this, is it quantified, or is it just for every ID you have to write? So it depends, it depends of your model. If you take a very simple model, it will be just a constant. For example, I just consider a, a simple model where I have Alice and Bob, and that's it. So ID will be one just a constant ID A for Alice and ID B for Bob. But then you can go for a richer model when you let another process generate IDs and say, okay, I have some registration process when any arbitrary number of voters, and then it would be another variable. So then it's, it would be yeah, uh, more... Yeah, yeah, then it would be uh, a Y here and you would have other quantification about this Y. Yes. So... You have this attacker that is translated in a set of uh, first order logic. You have the protocol that is also uh, transformed in a set of, of, uh, of first order logic formulas. And then, for example, if you want a simple property like the attacker should not know the secret, you just add not attacker the secret. And what is very nice is that uh, whether or not your, your protocol is secure is whether or not uh, this set of formula is consistent, which is mathematically well-formed. Um, so, uh, yeah, we are now back to a well-known problem. Of course, the issue is that, well, it's, comp well, okay. Okay, so how to do it? Uh, so standard techniques is to use, uh, okay, I can also, I can still say it here. So spoiler, you, I guess, part of you know it already. This is uh, highly undecidable. So there is no way I can decide this. Yeah, but it's still what Proverif does. So, how does Proverif works? It works with a very standard technique, uh, which is resolution. So you start with your set of uh, formulas, and then you add logical consequences until you find a contradiction. Okay, and you're very happy if uh, your strat your uh, techniques is correct. So you only add formulas that are logical consequences, not something that is uh, not a logical consequences. So this is correction. Your, if it is complete, so if there is a contradiction, then you eventually find it, okay? And you're really, really happy if it's, you can always uh, find this contradiction in a finite number of steps, because then you have a, a decidable, uh, decidability result, so you know if there, is a, if there is a contradiction, you will eventually find it. You will find always complete in a finite number of steps, so either you find a contradiction or you don't, but you know whether you have a contradiction. But as I say, spoiler, it's undecidable, so there is no way it terminates in a finite number of steps. And actually, uh, Proverif is not even complete. Okay, There might be a contradiction and still doesn't find it. So Proverif is just correct. So, it implements a correct procedure still <laughs> that may not terminate, that may stop without any answer. And it's based on a resolution strategy uh, that works very well in protocol. So the idea is really we have the process, we translate it in horn clauses, we do this saturation, uh, so adding uh, consequences until Proverif stops. And either uh, it has found the contradiction. So actually, it's not just verification of the query is slightly more complicated because it's not just a not of attacker, it might be a correspondence queries. So sometimes what we need to verify is more difficult than just a contradiction. Okay, and so how does it work uh, a bit uh, slightly more in detail? So it's binary resolution. So if you have H implies C and F uh, H prime implies C prime, that then Proverif, I mean, uh, the resolution is you find uh, unification. So a sigma that makes C sigma and F sigma equal. You can, of course, take the most general one when you have an equation theory where it exists. And then you deduce as a consequence that H sigma, H prime sigma implies C prime sigma. Okay? So this is correct. 
But if you do it like just like this, it really does not terminate. I mean, it's correct, but you would have a prov your own proverbs that never terminate, basically. So the profile strategy, the core strategy is very simple. Uh, it's correct. Is that it never does resolution if the fa if you, re you are not allowed to do resolution on a, on a, on a lit literal that is i of a variable x. Okay. That, that, that's basically it. This is correct. And moreover, it has a very well crafted order, meaning in which order it does the re resolution is very well crafted with some parameters uh, um, that are well, well crafted. So the limitation is that, as I was mentioning, there are over approximations. So for example, imagine you have a protocol where you assume that voters vote only once, or at least the voting server will only answer one query per voter. It's, this is your protocol. Then you have an issue with this for all quantification. Okay, because you have, you have written this, this line can be processed only once. So for any V, yes, but only once. And you get a formula that says for any V, if I of V, uh, then voted IV. And of course, this can be used many times. I mean, you have no way, uh, at least in pure first order logic, to say this could, can be uh, applied only once. So you would, you would have several voted events typically. So the idea is that you could add axioms. You could enrich your logic. Uh, saying there are some axioms that says, still not perfect, but at least if you have a voted event ID V1R and ID V2 VR, uh, R2, then V1 equal V2 and R1 equal R2. You can still have these, these limits. Uh, you still, you might still have several times the same events, but at least they are always equal. It's better than, you know, it should be applied only once, but here you, you at least say, okay, if it applies several times, at least it's with the same parameters. Uh, another issue with Proverif is that, as I said, it must not terminate. So you may want to help Proverif. You may want to say, hey, prov first prove this and then use it as a proof helper. So what does it mean, a proof helper? So, so it's what we did in a recent work. We, we add lemma uh, in, in the, in this proce in the Proverif process, meaning if he proves first, if, if Proverif uh, has pr first proved lemmas or if we just give it, give it axioms, you can use it in the saturation uh, of uh, in this saturation procedure, meaning, for example, if you have a clause H implies C, and if in, if Proveri has already proven F1 and F2 uh, yields G, then you can try to find substitution such that uh, F1 and F2 are actually in the assumption, and again, then you can add uh, H and J sigma in, in place C. So now it's it's less, this formula is less general than this one. And so hopefully it will gain more, uh, more information and this will, this will help the saturation. So this is what, what we have done. It's not always sound actually. Uh, so it's sound uh, if we were only uh, verifying uh, properties of the form uh, consistency. But since we have a ver verification procedure itself to, to, to check these correspondence uh, properties, this is not sound in general, so we have to find a fragment where it is sound. And we also wanted to do lemma by induction. And the way we do it, we put a keyword by induction, so the lemma is not yet proven. And then we let Proverive use the lemma to prove the lemma. So I guess you are telling your first year students that this is very, young, very wrong as a reasoning. Assume a lemma, use it in the proof, and deduce that the lemma is true. I mean, this is forbidden. And actually, we prove that this is correct in Proverif because uh, the, the order induced by the resolution done in Proverif gives you an order in which actually you can prove by induction the lemma. Okay? So, first order, I mean, uh, uh, bad reasoning of first year students somewhere else works. So, back to Beninius. So thanks to this, uh, I mean, so, in, so using Proverif, we could prove uh, basically what the, 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 the properties that I claim at the beginning, so verifiability except cast as intended. Uh, uh, alors, so if at least, so if I have a one here, it means dishonest. Uh, so if both the voting server and the registrar is dishonest, then I have no verifiability because I lose eligibility. They are both dishonest, they can add uh, ballots. 
Okay, and for privacy, I have privacy if uh, not uh, if not too many authorities are corrupted. If they are uh, if too many are corrupted, then they know the secret key, and so they break uh, privacy. Okay, but so what is not good in Belenius? So we still have to work on cast as intended in Belenius. You have to trust your computer when you click on A. You have to trust that Belenius encrypts A and not B. Okay, we have no protection against this, and we have no receipt freeness. Uh, and this is due to the fact to many facts, but in particular, um, in Belenius, the built-in board is public. Okay. So here there is my ballot, by my ballot. If I give you all what I use to construct my ballot, in particular the, the randomness, I can prove you that this is my ballot and this is how I voted. So I can prove my public ballot is a proof on how I voted. So, I mean, next time you use Belenius, if you want to sell your vote, you may try. Okay. Um, but let's have a closer look at privacy because we recently discovered float in Belenius, and this is actually how we found also a flow in, in the Swiss uh, setting. I don't know how much time, maybe, or maybe I should switch to the conclusion. Yeah, another 10 minutes, Plenty of time. Then. So, in uh, in election, it's often the case that actually it's not one election but several elections at the same time. Is there because there are two rounds? Uh, so in France, it's often the case that we have a first round, we reduce the number of candidates, and then we have a second run. But even when you have only one run, it's often the case that there are several, what they call circle uh, in, in, uh, in, in Switzerland, uh, what we call uh, circonscription or uh, just uh, bureau de vote. Okay? You actually tally the election per smaller Uh, we have a, you have a lot of smaller ballot spots. So you have one election, but actually a lot of small election in practice. And what is convenient, very convenient uh, for the trustees, remember that the trustees have to hold the keys are real people. Okay? So they have general energy to generate the key in the distributed way and to keep securely the key. And then they have to actually handle not one election, but maybe 10, maybe uh, 1,000. And it's very convenient to use the same key for all the elections. Okay, because you're not going to have uh, 1,000 USB sticks, for example. So it's much easier. But it also means that you are actually using the key for several elections, so you could be used as a trustee as a decryption oracle. Because now, I mean, it's, it's not good to use the key. I mean, the crypto is solid enough, but it, you should not be induced to decrypt, uh, to use your key in, a, in an election where you shouldn't use it. So in Belenius, we have some protection because uh, you have these credentials for, uh, for your, uh, you, you sign your, your, uh, your ballot. And actually, this credential is used also uh, in your ballot. So it's not possible to transfer one ballot from one election to another election. So somehow it protects, uh, uh, it avoids the confusion between, uh, between elections. But let's go at the Swiss context. So as I said, it's really, uh, a very nice context in terms of uh, legal requirements. Uh, they ask for cast as intended, recorded as cast, and universal verifiability, at least for proxies. It's not universal, nothing is public, but you can become uh, an external editor if you want. And ballot privacy, so it's not K out of N. They have what they call uh, control components. There are four control components. Each of them has a, has a key. So it's four keys, and you need these four control components to decrypt, plus a threshold of authority. So some, intuitively, you have four computers. They have each one share of the key. And the fifth share is shared among the threshold of authorities who, who are human beings. So there are a call for public scrutiny and a, public, uh, and a bug bounty program, which is still ongoing. If you want to play, you, you, you can. And elections have multiple counting circles. I mean, it's an election uh, among a canton. And then for each uh, small district, or what they call circles, they have to decrypt. And so how does it work? You have this, you, so the elections are actually split in several ballot boxes, one for each circle. Then the first control component shuffles uh, the, the ballots and decrypts with its share. Okay, so it removes one key and it shuffles the ballots. Then the second control component does the same. It shuffles the ballot and removes its key, and so on. 
and the fourth one shuffle and decrypts, and then it will be the the the, the, trust, the, the decrypting the authorities that will decrypt the final ballot box. And in the switch settings, they want privacy even uh, if they are all corrupted but one. Okay, so you should have vote privacy if you trust at least one of these components, which means that as an attacker, I can corrupt all of them except one. So if I assume the first one is, it is, it is honest, so the first one will do this job, plus it will add one more election with only the ballot of Alice. Since it's the first one, it is also corrupted with the voting server, so it may have seen from which the, the ballots come, so it knows that this is the ballot of Alice, and it will add one more ballot box with just the ballot of Alice, alone. Okay? Then CCM2, CCM3 are honest, so they just shuffle and decrypt all these boxes. And then the last one is dishonest. We'll decrypt it, so now he knows uh, the... So here I also have the right to, to corrupt the, the, the trustees. So now the CCM1 knows the, the vote of Alice. And of course, silently, I will remove this extra ballot box because I want to cover uh, my, my, my tracks and give it to the final uh, CCM. Okay? And you could say, yeah, but if this one are honest, then they know, right? They should not decrypt this extra one. The thing is, it's just, I mean, in the end, even if you have a human operating the computer, it's just an algorithm. And it's they, just a thread, a thread uh, yeah, multiple threads that just receive ballot box and decrypt it. And they actually would not notice here uh, that, that, uh, that uh, one extra ballot box has been added. Okay. So uh, we were quite happy to tell uh, our uh, uh, director of uh, Loria that uh, now the Loria is very well known in Switzerland because this is named the Loria issue. Okay. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah. So the Loria is known now, and actually it's not so easy to fix. Uh, it's not so easy to fix just because, uh, of course, if you know very well in advance how many ballot box you, you have to receive, then you can. But it's not always the case. And I suspect that uh, in, in the French context, we would have the same kind of issue because uh, because you do not have so much control on how many, how many things you are going to decrypt. Okay. So to conclude, uh, it's really a thing that I like because we have still a lot of challenges. So some are uh, technical. We still need to improve our formal verification techniques, uh, in particular for larger equational series. Uh, so Proverif is very nice, but we may want uh, finer uh, properties. We may want a tool that terminates even more often. Um, we are still at the level where we don't even know what is a good system. What, we know I started my talk with what is a good system, uh, what is a good devoting system. We still don't know, actually. We have identified some properties, but we're still coming with new ones. And how to properly define them is still an ongoing uh, research. We definitely need more, uh, better uh, e-voting system. So like uh, no vote buying, like I mean, Bellinus is, is not at all uh, receipt free, so it can be used to sell votes. Uh, it does it's not also everlasting private. So these are many properties for which we do not have good solution. Or as I said at the beginning, we have a solution for no vote, no correction resistance, but then doesn't solve the other issues. So we less, we need to, to design protocols that have less trust assumption. So what if your computer is corrupted? Uh, what if, uh, yeah, many, many people are computed, are corrupted? One very hard problem is also the authentication. I mean, in many systems, authentication is just you receive password by emails or postal, postal, postal mail. So, which means you can sell your credential, people can st steal it. So, this is very difficult. And we also need, uh, I think, a better involvement of the general public uh, so, so that uh, we get a better usability and also better regulation. Because if we don't have a better regulation, then, then, then Typically, companies do not uh, improve uh, that well. Okay, so we have we have written indeed a, a book that uh, Claire was referring to, try to to give some to share our uh, to, to to initiate a discussion with the public uh, on that subject. Thank you. So, uh, are there any questions? <coughs> yes. Uh, another complex of one. For instance, the news, what forbids the trustees who generate the keys to generate some extra keys to avoid some extra times? So the, um, so the trustees 
Uh, so the keys for the trustees cannot that does not allow them to vote, right? It just, they generate the public key. I go back to the, here. So they generate together the public key of the election. So now the public key is the one everyone will use. But if they generate an extra key with the wrong public key. No, uh, 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 you can generate extra credentials. Okay. Uh, so uh, indeed, the registrar could provide, could generate extra credentials. And the question is whether it would let it accept, but the ballot box publicly uh, display the list of public credentials. So first, as a, an external observer, you should make sure that the number of credentials is equal to the, to, to the number of voters. So this is like the first uh, protection. So if there are more credentials than the number of voters, as an external uh, observer, you should say there is something wrong. Okay. As an external observer, you can yeah, see the... Uh, question being, uh, when uh, are these uh, credentials publicly known? Are they known when they are used? No. Or beforehand? Yeah, they are, so beforehand... If they are known beforehand, yeah. uh, why wouldn't the, the ballot box be able to say, well, there are this many credentials, this many are unused, at yeah. the end of the votes, I can use them to add as many votes. So, you have to trust that either the registrar or the server is honest. So at the beginning, they, they each receive the voter list. So they, yeah, they each receive the voter list. Of course, then they can do whatever they want. So if the voting server is honest, it generates passwords and send passwords for one for, for each uh, voters. And then the registrar generates one, it's supposed to generate one credential for each voter, send the credential to the voters, and send the public credential to the, okay, okay. To the election server. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yes. So I have a question. Is it possible that you would add properties that we can't have in physical systems? So I mean, the example I had in mind that there was the European elections a few years ago, and I know for sure that my neighbor didn't vote for candidate X just because there was zero vote mm. in my uh, city for this candidate, and I mean I. I if he had wanted to sell his vote by saying that he voted for this candidate X, then I would have broken his legs. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, but then if you have this kind of stuff, uh, I mean, we could just say, oh, by the way, the person who won the election is this person, and we don't have this kind of... Uh, exactly. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think you, your, your question uh, refers to what is the result of an election, for instance. For instance. So, and indeed, for example, assume the result of the election is just the winner, like, or the winners if there are several seats. Uh, then indeed, a paper ballot election leaks much more information. So for some of them, uh, I mean, for, for paper ballot election just leaks, I mean, how each one voted, you just don't know who voted what. In Bellinius, you can see that you leak less. Because for example, if I can, uh, if I can vote for three candidates, uh, I can always, for, for example, I, I assume I can always select three candidates. Then you will not know which combination. You will just know the total number of votes. So it leaks, it, it, it leaks less. But still in your example, maybe uh, no one voted for A and you can still break, uh, I don't recommend it, but you can still uh, take revenge on, on, on your neighbor. And so, uh, yes, in, in, uh, this is exactly an example where uh, cryptographically we can do more. So if the authorities, the public decide the result is this, like uh, just the winner or the winner plus something, then uh, we can actually uh, let the authorities compute in M using MPC techniques, so multi-party computation. They can actually only compute the result plus the proof, and we can leak uh, much less. So for example, uh, uh, previous uh, PhD students, uh, Quentin Young, uh, shows that this is actually feasible and in a reasonable time. And now the question is really, are politics ready to do this? Because, for example, at the legislative election, so we were third party for the legislative election in 2022, and we notice, it's not a surprise, but we notice that small, some uh, uh, bureau de vote are very, very small. <laughs> and so sometimes there is only one ballot. Okay? And the results are public. So, but you elect a deputy. So the circumscription is big. Okay, so why tally per uh, bureau de vote? Well, you could just put all the ballots together and give the result at the level of the, of the, of the deputy. This you could do. I mean, cryptographically, it's just 
trivial to do it. But of course, they want, and it's even they want, and legally for the moment, it's mandatory to actually give the result for each bureau vote. But it's another example where you could compute at a upper level and have better privacy. So yes, there are cases where you can do better thanks to the cryptography because you don't need to process ballots one by one. In your introduction, you distinguish between security properties and non-security properties. You said that availability is not a security property. Is that a formal distinction? No, yeah, there's more to say. This is a property I don't want to, to, to talk. But no, it's, no, no, there's no formal. Of course, they are related. If, if you build a protocol where it will be easy to conduct uh, DOS attacks, for example, then it's also an issue. I mean, of course, if you can make the voting server done, it's an attack, so so it's not completely unrelated. Uh, so perhaps to formulate it differently, when you speak about security properties, are you only speaking about safety properties, or the liveness? Can a liveness property also be a security property? Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, some sometimes liveness property can also be a security property. Like these things will eventually happen. Uh, no, there is no formal distinction between between both. And I could even say, I also said usability is not my area of uh, expertise. Definitely it is not. On the other hand, when we design a protocol, we have to think about the voters that will perform some tasks. I mean, it's also, yeah. And if I can just explain what I mean by usability, you said that there's no Uh, yes. So, for example, in for example, in Bilinius, now just for Bilinius, um, of course, for, in many cases, they just let uh, many user uh, election administra administrator just let Bilinius, so our voting server, both generate generate the password and the credentials. So then you, I mean, if, if it is corrupted, it is corrupted. But some does the fact uh, use the fact that actually the registrar just generates some randomness. And then you can just designate uh, someone in your uh, election that will generate this uh, credential. And so physically, he will generate the credential on his own computer and then send them by sending some email and store them securely in some manner, and not at all in, on the voting server. So I can be, you can be a uh, registrar. Uh, it will be just a JavaScript running, or, or if you just to use, uh, you can also, there is a, I mean, Venus is also on the Debian distribution, so you can also install Belenius, generate the credentials, send them by email to your voters, and, and that's it. Of course, in, for big elections, that's an issue because then it means you need another company to do it, so it's not, uh, it's costly. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned that the attacker in your model is, uh, is a phenomenal developer, essentially. Yeah. Yes. And sort of probably a question coming from somebody from a very different area, but it kind of sounds a little bit like outdated 1970s, 80s to me. I mean, these days we have uh, commercial systems that are in the process database that we complete algorithms and data studies or two terabytes, right? So is this really a realistic assumption that you cannot have a smarter or more computationally uh, potent uh, adversary than just a problem of time algorithm? Well, in cryptography, this is still the paradigm. Uh, but, uh, I mean, uh, we can, I mean, for example, we have teams that try to break uh, encryptions uh, and algorithms. And, they are, I mean, they can do extrapolation, like uh, if they had uh, uh, just their power as researcher using grid of computer, or if they were the NSA. So, I mean, I'm, I think they are considering... Um, Reasonable attackers, but it's, it's true that it's still uh, like uh, so. Yeah, it's still, it's still the paradigm. Uh, what you put in a time attackers. I see. And, and one thing I didn't understand: what this assumption actually enters your formalization to the formal process? Yeah. Ah um, so, so. Oh, no. So yeah. So good question. So how do we formalize this uh, in our formal model? Uh, the short answer is we don't. <laughs> Uh, here we uh, what we assume what we say, what we could call perfect uh, encryption. So the attacker can encrypt, 
and can decrypt, but only if he has the key. If he doesn't have the key, he cannot do it, do anything. So it's much more limited attacker. It's, uh, so it can do, there is no polynomial because intuitively he can do all this action. It's for all. So it's really unlimited. But in the other hand, we assume a perfect cryptography. Uh, so. Delegate that to cryptography. Exactly. Exactly. I have a question which is less technical, but since you talked about the legislation for example, in Switzerland, which I understand is quite advanced. So, for example, they're required to, as you said, two kinds of proofs that the system is good or has some properties. Now, as in, for example, for the symbolic proof, the link between the formalism of the proof and the, the implemented algorithm act itself, is there anything in the legal system that tries to guarantee that this is the same or I just, you know, implemented one thing and proved the uh, written a formal description of a different system which is mm. absolutely great? Yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree. There is a distance between the model. Uh, so somehow there is a code, there is a specification, and there is a proverif model. So at least in Switzerland, they try to keep a good consistency, like at least towards notations uh, and so on. But there, are, there is absolutely no uh, guarantee nor even requirements that there is a correspondence. So it's more like a visual inspection. So yeah, I would say the formal models give you some guarantee about the protocol and what is in the specification, but it's not sufficient. And so the rest is more done by public scrutiny, uh, bug bounty programs, and so on, these, these kind of things. Uh, the link between this formal specification and the code is kind of something that... At the moment, there is no like uh, uh, automated general code generation. Um, yeah. <coughs> on the other hand, uh, if the protocol is correct at the level of the specification, um, then there are many codes that you don't need to trust. So in particular here, they assume a dishonest uh, voting server. Then you actually don't care. You, you care about the verification algorithms, and this one are smaller, and you could actually hope to generate them automatically from code. It's not done, but this one is much smaller, so you could hope. And also you care less about performance, because if your verification takes two days, well, that's not too bad. So. Any more questions? Okay, so thank you again very much. Thank you.